What is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Hook Shots Podcast. I am your host, Joe Cermelli, and do you know what today is? Damn Skippy, it's Snakehead Day. And if you follow the goings-on of us Hook Shotsy people on the Hook Shotsy Facebook page or read the things that I write for the fields and the streams, you are probably not surprised that Snakehead Day hath finally arrived. You knew this topic was coming. And it's a controversial topic, isn't it? Isn't that what makes snakeheads kind of fun? It gets everybody's hackles up. From Florida to New York, your hackles, they go right up. And I am here to say on public record that I f***ing love snakeheads. I love snakeheads. Snakeheads are the shit. And part of the reason why I wanted to do this podcast is because I would love to think that maybe it's possible to convert some of the haters into lovers. And here is why I am not afraid to say what I just said, okay? I'm not afraid to shout my love of snakeheads from the mountaintops because they're never going away. They're here. It is done. They have a stronghold on the East Coast in many places that will never change. You cannot beat them. It's over, okay? Snakehead naysayers, snakehead haters, it's over. You'll never beat them. They're here to stay. So if you can just accept that, if you can just get your head around the idea that these fish are not going to go away, that's done, finito, never happening, okay? If you can't beat them, maybe you ought to try to join them. Because maybe you are missing out on something. And me and a whole lot of other people, including our special guest today, are going to agree that you are missing out on something by snubbing your nose at these horrible, wicked, evil fish that are capable of crawling into your backyard, unlatching the gate. They can do that, you know. Crawling across your patio and eating your cocker spaniel. Of course, actually, that's a load of bullshit, but that's actually what people thought they could do, okay, uh, 20 years ago when the whole snakehead outrage started. The snakehead atom bomb was dropped in the Potomac River in Maryland and Virginia and subsequently right around the same time in the canalways around Miami, okay, People were were making the cat come in at night, okay, because they didn't want a snakehead to crawl across the lawn and snatch them. Horrible, shitty, B-horror movies have been made about snakeheads, okay? The quote-unquote Frankenfish for many years there, okay? It had, like, infected pop culture, and it was like an Ebola type of scare, in the fish and wildlife world. And so potent was the message of the governments at the time about the invasive snakehead, which they were sure were going to wipe out all native fish everywhere that the snakeheads ended up, that people are so stuck on that mentality, they don't want to hear Anything about what actually happened 20 years later, now that there's been 20 years to study these fish and their behavior, okay, which means that I'm not sure, though I hope, that someday there will be a time when I can post a photo of a snakehead that I caught that I worked really hard to catch and I'm really proud of, and you don't have 500 ignorant people going Kill him all. Kill that ugly thing. Kill him. I hope you cut his head off. I hope you killed him. He's killing every, killing all the natives. He's killing all the natives. He's killing everything. It's all dying. Kill him. Because guess what? Okay. 20 years is a long time to do a case study on a fish and see how it interacts within that ecosystem. And guess what science and anglers who actually are open-minded and pay attention are finding out? Ah, uh, they really didn't affect a whole hell of a lot. Uh, sorry, that, that's that's the truth. I mean, the 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 amount of damage they've done, I think it's fair to say, versus the amount of damage that they have not done where they were supposed to, 
um, is, is pretty staggering, okay? Now, I do want to make one point very clear. I want to make one point very clear. Am, am I saying that snakeheads are a good thing? Should they have been introduced to the waters along the East Coast? No. No, okay? Like, they, they shouldn't. They shouldn't be here. And when this whole scourge first popped up all those years ago, I mean, I didn't know anything about them. I didn't know any more about how they would affect an ecosystem than, you know, the people who were just starting to study them. So I paid attention, and I was like, oh, shit, like, this this could be this could be really, really bad, okay? But as the years went on, in, in, instead of just sticking to my guns on that kill them all idea— you know, I I started I started listening and actually reading and paying attention instead of spewing wild comments that were completely unfounded. And then I started fishing for them, which by default forced me to pay very close attention to how they are behaving and interacting with species that already existed in the places where I fish. And while I am not the be-all, end-all authority on this, I can tell you hands down, the places I fish, there's uh, been no visible uh, difference in populations of any other species within those, those places. Matter of fact, you know, I, I know a lot of people. I have a lot of contacts all over the country, and a lot of them are bass fishermen or full-time largemouth bass or smallmouth bass guides that lives squarely in the range of the snakehead from South Florida all the way up to where I live here in Pennsylvania. Not one of them ever, never, not once, period, has ever said that they have noticed even the slightest decrease in bass population or bass activity since the snakeheads have taken a stronghold in in major watershed systems like the Potomac you know, like the Delaware, like the canalways down in Florida. And and you don't even really have to take anglers' words for that. I mean, the same scientists who were trying to figure out just how bad these fish were going to be 20 years ago, okay, have done a lot of research and a lot of really smart people are, 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 are coming around saying the same thing. It's like, ah, you know what? Um, these fish have just kind of assimilated. They, they've carved their niche within these systems and as it turns out hey they're not nearly as as detrimental or or harmful uh, as we thought we were going to be uh but it only seems to be people like me that enjoy fishing for snakeheads who pay attention to that stuff okay the the people a vast a large majority of which uh truth uh who love to trash them don't even live where snakeheads live they've never fished for one they've never observed how uh, they affect a, a waterway or a pond or a lake or a river that they fish on their own. They're, they're out, you know, elsewhere in the country, and they're just throwing down hype based on the Frankenfish scare of old. So for the people listening who do not live in snaky territory, okay, let's, let's, just, let's just knock out a couple of facts so we're on the same page, okay? The way that these fish got introduced to the waters here on the East Coast from Florida all the way up into Queens, New York, there's some snakeheads, uh, okay, is the black market aquarium trade because they're very pretty fish. And though they've been illegal for a long time, there is a black market trade and, you know, shit happens. And some extra fish from the uh, back alley at the pet shop there end up getting dumped. Also, they are a delicacy, a huge food fish over in Asia. And uh, as the the rumor goes, you know, some were smuggled over here live for eating purposes. And I guess whoever those people were, their eyes were bigger than their stomachs. They couldn't eat all their snakeheads. So they thought a good thing to do would be to uh, release what they're not eating into the Potomac. And it's, it's the exact same carbon copy story in Florida. OK, and there are two species of snakehead in this country. In Florida, you have the bullseye snakehead. And then from Virginia, Maryland, north, you have the northern snakehead. Those are the ones that I fish for, though I have fished for both, which we'll talk about. Now, one of the things, as I joked about, that scared people was, you know, these fish can crawl over land. They can breathe air. And a lot of people thought that, uh, you know, that was going to be what made them so deadly is they can just, you know, crawl across the highway. Yes, they can. They can crawl across land. That is true. Uh, But that is a survival mechanism. Uh, I don't think uh, a snakehead 
would just be like, you know what? Uh, this spot sucks. This lake sucks. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to take off. That's a survival mechanism that is, is, is put into use. And there are other fish that can do similar things that can do that too. Uh, you know, when your, your, your home, your water is drying up or your food source is depleted, uh, you know, <laughs> They don't do it just for the hell of it. I have never, in 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 the years that I've been snakehead fishing, come across a snakehead uh, just waddling across the field or something, or even for that matter, come across a dead, dried up one in the woods or on the path between ponds. Um, just I, I I've never seen that. So yeah, you know they can. That doesn't mean that they do it frequently. It's a survival mechanism. So what makes these fish so awesome to me and a lot of other people? I mean, make no mistake, I'm not the lone gunman here. Snakeheads have a huge cult following, and it's growing every year. Um, I'll tell you, you have to hunt a snakehead. You don't just go fish for a snakehead, okay? You hunt them like a muskie. So that right there, okay, makes it a little more fun than going largemouth or smallmouth fishing for me. Uh, the, the hit is very impressive. I mean, the way that they stalk a topwater frog and, you know, you'll, you'll find them in six inches of water and they, they wake it. And, uh, as we'll learn, you know, they have different personalities. Sometimes it's this little subtle sip and then you whack him and he goes ballistic. Sometimes, you know, they knock the frog three feet in the air and come back on it five times. It's it's an it's a very exciting fish to catch if you are a topwater junkie. Okay, they fight like hell. Sorry, largemouth guys, you pit a a five six pound snakehead against a five six pound largemouth. Guess which one is going to fight harder? I promise you, it's going to be the snakehead. They are vicious fighters. But more than anything, once once I realized that these fish are not going away, okay? It's, it's, it's pointless to talk about eradication. It's a done deal. And, you know, <laughs> I had them close to home on the Delaware River system. I can literally catch a snakehead down the street from where I'm recording this right now. You know, you look at the area where I live, and, and what did I grow up doing? You know, bluegills, smallmouth, largemouth, trout fishing. Love all that stuff, I love it. That's 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 what I grew up chasing, and I will always love all that stuff. But if you stop and think about it, how often do you have the opportunity in your lifetime to all of a sudden have something there that was never there before that needs complete rethinking of tactics and, and needs figuring out? You don't just go out and, and catch them. You sort of... You know, you don't stumble into them that easily if you want them. You know, you, you got to plan and you got to think. And I mean, I've scoured Google Maps for three years now and, you know, pissed away a lot of time macheting into offshoots of the Delaware and back creeks and slogging through mud. Most of the time having it turn up nothing. But then all of a sudden you find this little nook, this little this little cove off somewhere that you made all this effort to get to and you make three casts with a frog and you see that wake and it's like, yeah, it's, it's, it's more satisfying to me, at least right now, because I'm just addicted to this, than just floating the river like I have been for years and catching smallmouth. We'll always love that. That'll never go away. But, I mean, it's this new thing that's just dropped on you and, you know... <laughs> Isn't that isn't that the fun of being an angler is, is figuring stuff out, you know, using what you know, learning, taking notes and figuring stuff out. Anyway, the point of this is not to harp on, uh, you know, the destructiveness or non-destructiveness of the snakeheads, because, again, irrelevant in the long run. They're here. So it's just a matter of whether you choose to hate them for the rest of your life or say maybe these things are worth a shot. And I was thinking really hard about who to have on for this episode because I got a whole bunch of, of snakehead loving buddies, but you know, no disrespect to them, but like, you know, who cares what they have to say? It's just like, you know, it's just one of my boys who enjoys snakehead fishing. We needed, uh, you know, somebody that I would consider, you know, a very respected authority in the fishing world. And that somebody 
is my good buddy, uh, Alberto Nee, better known as Crazy Alberto Nee, a nickname which he has had for a very long time. And I met Alberto many years ago working for Saltwater Sportsman Magazine. He lived uh, on Long Island in New York, and he now lives in Florida. But even though he's he's been down there for a lot of years, he is still considered by many people one of the authorities on striper surf fishing. I mean, this dude cannot cast a line in the Northeast for five years, come back, have a seminar, and pack house. I mean, that that is, that is how uh, coveted the information in his brain about surf fishing for stripers is. And, and this is a guy who's fished all over the world, okay, uh, catches a lot of big fish wherever he goes, okay? He is a big fish junkie. But since he moved to Florida, he has fallen in love with the exotic scene, the backwater canal scene, and in particular, he is all about some snakeheads. And I, I don't know. I think it's 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 fairly impressive that that somebody of of Al's stature in the fishing industry. He also owns uh, Tactical Anglers Lure Company, so he, he owns a lure company. He's a very respected authority. I mean, he's he was not afraid to go on record with me to talk about how awesome these fish are. Okay, you know, some other people might be because they're too afraid of people, you know, coming down on them for for saying how much they enjoy these fish and, you know, for saying that they also don't see them as the the problem that it was once thought they would be. You know, so maybe just maybe there will be a point in history when these fish are just accepted as a game fish or, you know, a, a, a sporting target. And all my peeps out west and out in the Midwest, you might be booking trips to a snakehead lodge one of these days to get down on this. And if I can't convince you, maybe Crazy Al can. Crazy! But that's how it goes. Hello? The crazy one, Alberto. Who is it? Is you know it who, Joe? You, you know who this is. <laughs> You know who How this you, is? Good, man. How I know, the crazy one. What's going on there, bud? What's N- happening? Nothing's happening, man. It's September. You know the drill up here in the Northeast. It's like that funky between good things time, isn't it? Uh, there's really no doubt time, but I tell you, the striped bass, uh, I was just there, and uh, the fishing is really, really good. And guess what? Those fish are migrating, and uh, the tons of peanut bunker and bunker uh oh i just wish i was there again <laughs> <laughs> yeah but dude aren't you aren't you uh like in the middle of mullet run in florida right now uh uh who told you that absolutely <laughs> uh every every single every single person on facebook that lives in florida told me about that yeah yeah it, it, it's crazy but at the same time you, you know i'm targeting other uh evasive species where uh, it's really cool. I tell you, it, it, uh, it's pretty hot. What's going on over here now? Well, I know, and that's what we're going to get to the bottom of, because you could not visit the Northeast for like five years and still come back up here and outfish most people on uh, stripers. So, dude, like, I want to get to the bottom of how the striper sensei of the Northeast turned into such an addicted Florida backwater <laughs> weird invasives guy. You know what I mean? Uh- well, let me just put it this way. You know, there is a lot of underground folks that are keeping it incredibly hush hush. And, uh, we're, we're talking Florida here, the home of evasive species. And, uh, from clown knife to snakeheads and tilapia, peacock and all that. I mean, we, everybody needs to know about this. It's freaking unbelievable. Well, it's hot. Yeah, no, I know. And if, if, if you were to judge what you do based on just your Facebook feed, you're either catching weird stuff or eating sushi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then some. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because, I don't know, people don't know, but you are like an extreme foodie as well. So you're either catching something, cooking something, or eating something raw based uh, on everything. Well, if it's related, to, if it is related to fishing and the things that I love, uh, there's nothing more than art, eating fish, catching fish, pushing the limits, and just everything about outdoors is, is wonderful. I tell you. Well, mm-hmm. I'll tell you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you something, man. Like you and I have have sadly not gotten to fish together in 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 far too long, but. Um, you know, g- g- getting back to like, you know, how, how, how much of a foodie you are, 
When I first met you, right. I was an intern at Saltwater Sportsman, and you walked into our office wearing a slamming Hawaiian shirt. Like, I'll never forget this. <laughs> like, right out of the gate, I was like, yo, you got to be sure of yourself and have some balls to rock that shirt. And I was like, holy shit, that's crazy Alberto knee. <laughs> and we got we got chummy after that. And er, in those early years, when you were still living in Long Island, right. we uh, we definitely had some, I will say, misadventures, if you remember. Oh, of like every time Every time we would get together, it be some kind of misadventure notably the shinnecock inlet trip where remember the idiot tried to drive on at the beach with a bmw oh and i remember that the access road for oh everybody else god. that was a classic so every, oh my god. <laughs> every every time we got together for something there was like some bullshit like monkey wrench and i remember all these surf fishermen like trying to push this bmw out and they pushed it out and everybody else kept pushing and you were like Okay, break for it and jump in the truck, and we like got ahead of everybody to race out on that road. But what I was going to say was, we also we got together that time to trout fish the Connect Quad on Long Island. Oh yeah, and it was a miserable snowstorm that day. <laughs> like it was like terrible. And we went back to your place to warm up after we fished, and you made me a bowl a of soup. ramen. Oh yeah, and dude, I still <laughs> buy the same brand of ramen. <laughs> That we ate that day. From that point on, for the entire, like, f since then, dude, I have never bought, like, oodles of noodles or Marishwan ramen noodles again. Like, I have to hunt down the good kimchi stuff. And yeah. I still have a stash of this shit in my house right now, all these years later. So, Oh, my we, God. We, we, you, you need to come down here in Florida, <laughs> and i got to show you some new dirty tricks of how to cook and all that. It is phenomenal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, dude, you put a bowl of soup in front of me with like so all this weird shit in it. And I'm like, this is the greatest ramen I ever ate. So, you know, fishing aside, if nothing else, like I credit you for turning me on to what real ramen is. And now I snub my nose at <laughs> shitty cheap ramen. <laughs> don't forget the hot sauce, okay? <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. Dude, I they crack eggs in there and they had all kinds, yeah, all kinds of weird mushrooms. It was phenomenal. It's phenomenal. So I've become a, a ramen snot because of that. But, oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, man. So, you know, these days, I, obviously, you still do a, a ton of saltwater fishing down there. And right. you come up here to continue striper fishing and packing house, you know, at seminars and all that good stuff. But, dude, you post a lot of backwater exotics. And yeah. the reason I wanted to talk to you about snakehead specifically, and mm -hmm. uh, I actually joked, joked in the front half of this, it's like, well, I could call any one of a dozen of my friends who are in the snakehead fishing, but it's like, you know, who are they? We got to talk to an authority, you know, and you are a very respected guy in the fishing community with a lot of followers, and you are seemingly as ate up with snakeheads as I am. So, dude, did you did you catch snakeheads before you moved to Florida, or did this all start for you once you got down there? I know when I started down here, I started hearing rumors about snakeheads, and the more research I've done, and... uh I tell you, uh, it is still uh, kind of a hush-hush, but it's really not hush-hush because everybody needs to know about this fish because hands down, bar none, these fish are just like on crack, and they they, they <laughs> will pull drag, they will jump on you, they will break off on you, and then you want more. It's uh, I mean, mind you, I've caught all kinds of fish in my lifetime. and Of course, these, all over the world. Yeah, and these snakeheads, Oh my God, man! When you hook one up, forget it. You're totally hooked. You really got to try this, buddy. And I know you've done it before, but well, dude, you don't have to sell me. I do this like three days a week up here at home because oh, we're, I mean, we've got dude. plenty of them right here. Dude, 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 dude! I I just got back from uh, from PA, okay. And uh -huh. let me tell you, I've been snooping around there, and hands down, bar none, there are some northern snakes up there that is ridiculous. You know, oh, in, yeah. including yeah. Maryland's water. The, uh, these fish are highly evasive to a large degree. A lot of people are afraid of these fish, but let's be honest about it. These fish are here to stay. They're a wonderful fish, Dad. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, you know, so I'm fishing the Delaware and, and there's, there's definitely some of these fish a lot further north than people realize, but yes. like, yeah, you're probably talking more like the Philadelphia area. I mean, there's some some serious snake water yes. down around the Philadelphia area, and then you know, continuing all the way uh, all the way south into into Virginia. But right. um, you know, the the way I look at them, and and the point I'm making is, you know, in in the long run, because you see the same thing I do in yes. terms of people just instantly 
bashing them. And I find that a lot of those people are people that have never caught one or targeted one. And in a lot of instances, don't even live, you know, where snakeheads live. So would it have been better, maybe, if they were never here? Sure. But like you said, they are, and they're never going away. It's, it's, a, it's a done deal, and it's the same story in Florida as it is here. Correct. Um, even though, you know, we are talking about different species. So, right. so you have the, the Well, the northern ones, the nor- northern ones are, are, are more prone to all kinds of weather, but down here, the bullseye snakes, you know, anything below 50-degree temperature, uh, they're endangered. I mean, they, they will die. So if right. you look down in the uh, south southern parts of Florida, you know, and uh, still water, calm area, um, that's where these fish are. And, and, and I right. tell you, in, in all honesty, these fish demand respect. Seriously. Sure. But, oh, my God. If only people knew how well they fight. And they are incredible predators, but at the same token, they're not that easy to catch. They're no, not. <laughs> no, I, I, I actually, I attribute, you know, because people ask me a ton of questions because they know I snakehead fish so much. Right. I attribute it, like the way I put it for around here is it's musky fishing with better odds. And then some. You know? So, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's a great way to put it because it is like musky fishing. You're constantly looking. And, and I'll tell you, <laughs> these fish are so sensitive to everything. When you spot one, okay, forget it. They will hide. They will swim backwards. And uh, and if you miss one, they will not come back again. Right. Yeah. Right. I, I have, love yeah, to have, especially if you if you if you sting them, and that's you know if you sting one or he gets a taste of the frog or you know whatever it may be. Now there are there's definitely some some differences maybe in habitat between the northern ones that I catch, and I, I've always been told. And I can't say this is 100% true, but I've been told by some people that, that seem to know what they're talking about. You can't have the northerns where you live because it's actually too hot for them. They need the variance in temperature to survive, right. and it's too cold up here for the bullseyes. Now, right. by and large, like, um, you know, the biggest snakehead I've ever caught weighed just a hair over eight pounds, and that was really close to home where I live. Now, by. You know, Potomac River standards or Maryland standards, that's nothing. I mean, right. what, what's the, the – the they just – somebody just bow-fished a 17-pounder or something yeah, the, out of there, well, I think, the, just this the, season. The record uh, in your area, the northern, I believe, is 20 pounds. Right, yeah. right. So, the, yeah, so – but now the bullseyes, you know, what's a big bullseye? A bullseye is not going to hit 20 pounds. Right? No, ab- absolutely not. Uh, the The – Current world record for the bullseye essentially is uh, pushing over thirteen, actually twelve and and thirteen pounds. Okay. okay. The, the average, I would conservatively say, you're looking at about four to six pounds. Okay. 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 So, so, dude, tell me about like when was the first time you went out on a specific mission for these fish? Like uh, the first one you caught that really tripped your trigger? Well, uh, outside from. Uh, countless hours and research and so forth because nobody will tell you where they are and, and as it should be because the hunt is the fun part okay yep. and, 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 and I tell you it took me forever and um, the things that I found out and certainly you can go to the internet and find out everything that there is to know but you cannot nothing can substitute being underwater and hunting these things down Okay. Well, yeah, that is the fun because I do the same thing here. It's like, you know, plotting little Google Maps trips. And a lot of times it's a strikeout. But every uh, once in a while, you find that one little pocket and you're like, shit, got it. Not and only like, the there they pocket, are. and they, these, are, these fish are very prone to light, you know. Right, Anything, right. Uh, uh, early morning, sunset, and definitely these fish are nocturnal, okay. But um, uh, given the, the, the fact that we have uh, a lot of clouds, and particularly this time of the year, you know, the, the, the thunderstorms, these fish go ballistic. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've come down there, and I, I have chased bullseyes. In fact, the first snakehead I ever caught right. was a bullseye in South Florida, and that's what turned me on to say, okay, i got to try looking for these things at home. And right. I caught one the first time I ever went looking at home, and I was done from that point on. I was like, this is... This is my new jam, you know. But I remember when we were down there, right. we would we would fish from sun up to like ten o'clock in the morning. Right. Go back to the room and sleep until four o'clock because right. the guys we were fishing with were like, you know, yeah, we might get bit out here in the middle of the afternoon, but um, 
you know, it's it's so you're right. I mean, they are they are a very light sensitive fish, you know, down mm-hmm. there and up here. I have my most success early in the morning, cloudy days or, you know, uh, later in the evening is when they seem right. to, to turn on. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, you have this it's a little different where you are because you're pre- predominantly fishing canal ways, sort of confined yeah. spaces. Versus, you know, up here where, uh, you know, you have these massive floodplains and, and back creeks. So, I don't know. Would you say it, it's it's easier to sort of find them down there than it is up here? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't say easy. Well, it's easy to find out where they are. The hard part is to be able to attract these fish, you know. Right. And like you said, it, it's equivalent to uh, targeting muskies, and but the odds are much, much greater but the fact is, you still have to just keep on trying, hitting spots, points, coves, covers, and then edges, and, and little shadow lines. That's where you're going to find these fish. You know, not in the open area, but you've got to know the terrain. And and, and I tell you, <laughs> and once you do, it, 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 it's, I guess it's like a drug because you can never have enough of these fish. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and that's, you know... Uh... And, and, I, and I have a, a confession to make, <laughs> and you Uh-oh. might think this is ridiculous. All right, I knew of a hot tarpon bite. Okay, ridiculous. Okay. Okay. These fish were on on top and so forth, but that overcast cloud. I just said, "Hell, I'm not going to chase tarpon. I'm going to chase snakehead." And boy, that was <laughs> <laughs> dude. <laughs> now but go you know think what? about I, that. Think I, about I, that. I know. <laughs> I I don't have to think about it because. I, I do the same thing here. Like, you know, we'll have great conditions to, to drop the raft and do a, a smallmouth float or something. Right, right. And most of the time, you know, it, it's it's funny because you look at trout or smallmouth. I don't really keep track of how many of those I catch per year. But right. with snakeheads, I'm like, I, I can tell you right now, like this year I have 33. Yeah. Like, so I don't, it, it's weird that way. It It, it has – overridden it's almost like the smallmouth to me it's like well they're always there and I, i've done a ton of that so I, you know i can go catch smallmouth whenever but man right. oh it's a really snaky looking day or right. you know i will give up going out on a good smallmouth bite to just go machete into some other <laughs> shitty backwater <laughs> hole just to see if they're there you know and and i mean you're you're an exploratory fisherman i'm sure are you sitting in 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 a room right now surrounded by your leather bound logs from all the years yes uh, yes i am <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and i'm, I'm going to tell you and, and keeping a log on these fish it's unbelievable and and yes yeah. you you do have to go out of the the norm chasing snakehead and and you're right having machetes and and mind you you know, I'm not in the Northeast Coast anymore. I have to deal with freaking snakes and alligators. This is yeah. no joke. <laughs> and then the fire ants, forget about it. <laughs> yeah, man. I know. It is actually, you know, the worst thing I have to deal with up here is like poison ivy and stinging nettle. I don't have to worry about getting killed by something else while I'm out there, you know, looking uh, looking for a snakehead. No, that's that's absolutely true. Um, but, you know, I think one of the funniest things that I'm curious to hear if you agree, like you, you had mentioned already, you know, the, the people's fear right. of these fish. Right. Um, you know, I look at Florida and I think it's so ironic because, you know, who, who, who is, who is most upset by these is largemouth guys for the most part. Yeah. I and mean, that's who is most upset. And, you know, we, we will, we'll talk about up here, but down there, it's like, you know, you have these snakes that are not supposed to be there granted, right. but then your state promotes the stocking right. of peacock bass. Right. And if you ask me, that is one of the most aggressive fish <laughs> on the planet. I agree. So if you're if you're going to worry about something hurting your largemouth population, I would be a hell of a lot more worried about the peacock bass that actually go out and hunt than the snakeheads. Yeah, the peacock bass are uh, just as, I would, wouldn't say bad, but... They're just as evasive as the uh, tilapia, if you will. Right, and, right. Uh, well, and, 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 and keep in mind that, that our snakeheads, actually in, in, in all the snakeheads, um, there was one, and they're evasive for that very reason, but um, I don't mind, and people are going to hate me for this one, I don't mind that there's a lot of snakeheads, only because, okay. it, you know, there's so much fun. I mean, it, it, it's a. I believe 
you know, in, in the next 10 years, this fishery is going to be incredibly viable because it requires, well, there's, there's a lot of challenge into catching these fish and everybody says they're everywhere. I will challenge them. Yes, there are times as the, during the spawning season because we have uh, two spawning uh, seasons here. Okay, we have right, right. The, the, the March all the way up to, to May and then we have the, 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 the heat uh, in August. Um, but I tell you, those are the times they become vulnerable. But outside from that, the hunt is on. It is like chasing, literally chasing the muskies. Sure, and yeah. and and we see the same thing here, and that that is one of the the attributes of these fish, right? That make them so invasive is that they they spawn multiple times a year, and right. and you know what what Al is talking about is a fish on a fry ball. Yes. So I mean. One of the uh, one of the easiest ways to catch one is during that spawn because you have right. the male and the female that Correct. do not deviate; they do not leave that right. fry ball. The same so thing with a peacock bass. The same thing. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So you you find a fry ball, and you're getting bit. I mean, Correct. you you drop a frog or whatever in the middle of that fry ball; those fish are pissed and. You know, uh, a bunch of the fish that I caught this year were on fry balls, and then all of a sudden those fry balls go away, right? And now they're not so easy anymore. Correct. Because now they are buried in the weeds, and they're not just in plain view swimming around, you know, with the fry ball. So, Correct. Correct. I mean, the 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 challenge aspect, um, you know, of, of of finding those fish, and they're so. I find them to be so temperamental. In fact, like a condition where you did good once, yes. you think like, you know, oh, I have that condition again today, and then you don't do shit. You don't even no, see no, them. no, 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 no. They're, exactly. You know what you know about them. You know you could write it down, but then they will throw so many curveball at you. It is no joke. Yes. You know, yes. And, 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 and go ahead. The, no, I was gonna say there, there's there's so much. Like even now, you know, so I've been doing this pretty seriously for three years now and right. I've learned a ton, but there's still so much that I, I haven't learned. And that's, you know, that to me is part of the fun of this whole thing. It's like, yeah, they, they shouldn't be here, but they are. So let's get over the whole get rid of them Correct. because they're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. In the meantime, say. yeah, it, yeah it, it presents this new thing to figure out. So just now, I mean, in the last couple of weeks, we had a bunch of rain and dropped the water temperature eight degrees very quickly. Right. And now, all of a sudden, I can't catch one. So are they done <laughs> for the year? Or do I need to do something different? You know, like, especially in transitional times like that, right. I still don't have those answers. I haven't been doing it long enough, but I'm having a hell of a good time trying to figure it out. Right. You know, I know what the smallmouth are doing now that right. the water temperature dropped off. So I don't know, man. Like to me, that's that's the fun. Is is it's a rare opportunity to suddenly have something new, you know, yeah. to go and figure out. And and and, and it's certainly um, uh, it's definitely new. And the greatest thing about it is it's extremely exciting because yeah. these fish fight like no but like nothing else, and it requires some level of skill. And you have to be sure. incredibly, you, you know, the the non spawning period. Okay. You have to be incredibly stealthy. And, and, and I'll tell you, long cast does pay off when it comes to that. Because, yes. and, and, well, and, I, and you gotta read points. You gotta point, figure out the points, the ambush spots, the shadow, the, uh, everything. You know, and, and I've yeah. seen, literally, you know, I have some certain areas that it, it's almost like my, uh, my go-to spots, if you will, the ace hole. Um, but if I walk fast, I've literally seen them. Okay, you, and, and they give them they give themselves away by because they're air breathing. Okay, they, they, yeah, they, sure. And you can see the little bubbles, you know, the little bubbles, and then you can see the water like snake like. And, and I love catching them in incredibly skinny water, and that, that's where they are because early early morning on the sunset on cloudy days, they're literally close to the shore because they're eating whatever there is to eat. They, they eat crayfish, they eat a uh, little uh, fish, but but I tell you, um, like frogs and buzz baits. Oh, top water. I'm talking yeah. top water. There is nothing well, like it. <laughs> well, it, it, it's it, it's such an imp- it's such an impressive hit, especially when they wake it. You know, when it, it's one thing. You know, you miss a lot of these fish when they come out of nowhere because they catch you off guard. You can't. You can't. You can't. Just like muskies again. Yeah. You can't ever have your guard down when you're snakehead fishing. But man, yeah, that is that is the addiction is is when they wake it and you know that he's coming. But to that end, you can catch these fish in you know slightly deeper water with spinner yeah. baits and mm-hmm. swim baits. 
I don't ever do any of that because no, to I don't me like it's that. like nah. I want I want the top water hit or nothing. Like yeah. it's like I either want to see him blow up on some shit or you know whatever you know you can have it. But the the funny thing is, you know, there's some spots around here and in, in South Jersey that are that are very well known, and right. you know, every time I visit one, you you'll see somebody else there snakehead fishing, and a lot right. of times you you'll you'll see these these guys who you know are, are they they haven't gotten it yet because right. they'll be there with a bait caster spooled with eight pound test mono and it's like uh dude you haven't caught one yet have you because <laughs> I mean, I, I'll tell you how, I, you know, I I'm learned dying very laughing here because I know where I you're going with this. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, that's one of those things. And on one hand, it's like, oh, that's, that's cool that you're out here trying to experience that because then maybe if you get one, that'll be one more person that gets it. Right. But I learned, you know, very quickly when I visited Florida, I knew right away. I mean, at minimum, I'm spooled with 30 pound braid and I, I don't use a leader. I tie direct to the braid. Okay. I've even had custom rods built yes. just so that when I'm fishing spots where I'm casting over 20 right. feet of pads, right. if I get bit, I know I can rip them through it. So, I mean, how do you, how, you know, what's, what's your setup, man? Because okay, you, okay. you have to take it a notch above. You know, your standard bass tackle, I am, or you're going to be very unsuccessful. Dude, I am so, I'm laughing so, oh, Jesus, my. <laughs> if, if you look at my tackle, okay, we're going, we're going for the dragon, if you will, okay? If yeah, you're going to go yeah. after these fish, when you look at my tackle, you would have swear I'm going for Bullzilla or Snookzilla, okay? Dude, but, same thing. I have rods, people are like, you could land a small tuna on that. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yes. If, if, if they're in the grassy area in grassy cove, I will go straight up a uh, bray line. And when I'm talking about bray, I go 40 and 50. Right. Okay. Right. And if I'm fishing in those lime rocks area or what have you, okay, anything that is sticky, I've, and I'll, I'll put it this way, I've had multiple snakeheads break me off on 40 pounds fluorocarbon. And the reason I use fluorocarbon is because it's, a, it's not because it's invisible, it's because of, it's very abrasion resistant. And right. I tell you, those lime rocks are so freaking sharp, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's nerve wracking, and the reason why I don't go straight up braid on those lime rocks because the diameter of most braids. Let's just say if you're using fifty pound braid, the diameter right. is equivalent to maybe twelve pounds to to eighteen pound test. The strength sure. of that in the real uh, uh, environment on the fighting battleground environment, it's twelve to eighteen pound test because it, right. it, they'll cut you off. I'm using, and don't laugh, I'm using 60-pound fluorocarbon. I'm not laughing. I get it. And, and, dude, and what I was talking about dude, is, it is a lot insane. of those. <laughs> I know. But what for, for anybody, you know, what I was talking about is a lot of those canalways and snaky spots in South Florida. Right. You know, it's it's limestone. So you have that limestone shelf rock on the side that's, yeah. that's very sharp. Now, I, I'm not dealing with a lot of a lot of rocks up here. I right. mean, in fact, we're mostly fishing just muddy slop. Other than pulling the fish through the vegetation, right. there's not a, a whole lot, you know, to cut you off. But Correct. it speaks to the, the the two different types of rigging. I I don't think sixty pound fluorocarbon. I mean, I I get it. So you know, <laughs> I always have you know in my pack when I'm doing this. Right. I always have fifty pound leader, forty pound leader. And the only reason I have it, I don't tie it on every time, but right. I, I think one of these days, I'm going to lay eyes on my ten plus pounder, <laughs> and I'm going to want to quickly like ramp up the insurance policy. I have, I, I always carry a rod spooled with sixty five pound braid. Yes. It might not be the one I'm throwing all the time. No, you're not going to do that all the time. But when, when you see D fish, okay, yeah, you want to. And your knees and your heartbeat's gonna just climb up like ridiculous. <laughs> uh, that's the fish you do not, and trust me, you don't want to lose that fish. And you only have that exactly. one shot. It's got to be perfect, right. you know. And, and I get, so, and obviously, you get it. And and people need to realize that this the, the adrenaline on uh, 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 chasing these fish is just mind boggling. You know. Well, in the, in the simplest terms, like if you listen to how you're rigging, how I'm rigging, I mean, that speaks alone to, you know, this is not something that you just grab any old tackle no. and go do. If you really, if you're really into this and you really want to, you know, up your percentage rates of, of getting one of these fish, you, you have to put some thought into what you're throwing. 
Yeah. Um, you know, you know, it, it, it's it's not just you know take the the regular bass tackle you've been throwing and go out there because you know in a lot of instances these fish also both the bullseye and the northerns right. they have a really hard jaw. So yes. You know, if I every time somebody's like, oh, you know, they'll hit me online. I'm, oh, I'm going to check out this spot for snakeheads, you know, and I'll give them some tips. And the last tip is always, and if you get bit, whack the f- out of them. And like, then some. You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> you know that term when I always say, you know, you got to cross a rise, and I mean yeah. it. I mean, it, it, to, it, it, yeah. it's not just your arm, it's your hip, your entire body. You yes. know, you just so, want to just, oh, my God, you just got to... If you don't hit her hard, the bigger they are, and like you said, their jaws are nasty, strong. They will yeah. laugh at you. They, all they all they have to do is just open their mouth and it's, and it's done. Yeah, you I know? mean, this is a deal. Like you carry a hook file, you know, like yes. like the musky guys do. You you know, you make sure. And I've seen it. We actually took. Um, you know, I feel bad calling him out because he's a nice kid. But we had an intern at Field and Stream this year who came uh, down to me, right? And he wanted it. He wanted to catch a snakehead. He thought that'd be neat. So I, I took him to one of my spots and right. like. You know, lay up. Oh, by the way, I heard about your spot. (laughs) What do you mean? Whoa. Okay. What do you mean you heard about my? Who'd you hear about my spots from? I I don't know what you're talking about. No, seriously, I've heard. (laughs) You've heard? uh, No, we're not continuing until you expand on what you're saying. What the hell are you talking about? Uh, You heard about my spots? Kerber. Oh, Kerber. All right, Kerber. Yeah, Kerber is is the is the is a prime example. Of a convert. Here's a guy who never really cared about snakeheads until I cared about snakeheads. And I was like, dude, you should come snakehead fishing with me. And he got it right away. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like one of, one of the biggest ones I ever caught. Right. Um, my second biggest, he was with me when I caught it. And then right. from then on, I could I could rope him in to snakehead fishing. And it only took him catching one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and now now he gets it too. He's as he's almost as ate up with it as I am. But okay, you scared me because I got some pretty damn secret spots, you uh, bastard. But uh, I know uh, Eric didn't know, get specific. Uh, okay, I'll give him <laughs> I'll give him a lot of credit because he gave me a general geographical uh, area, meaning oh, within okay. w- w- within about sixty mile radius. However, oh. however, however, he described the area to a T, and I just said. Nobody's going to do that, and you know what? Only you're right. Only the guys who understand these fish will go for yes. it. Because, yes, and you know what? Yeah. yeah, and and you're right because it's a it's a it's a funny deal, man. For as many people that jump onto a Facebook post to bash us every time we post a snakehead picture, right, dude? Right. By the same token. I don't think there's any fish I've ever caught and posted a shot of, not a striper, right. not a smallmouth, nothing, that I get more people begging for yeah. where I caught it. And the so it's so, it's so ironic. It's so ironic. You know? <laughs> right. And, and, and you know, and, and it, you know, <laughs> I'll give you a, a broad area, but it's like, hey, dude, I put in a lot of work and Google mapping right. to find some of this stuff. I'm not handing it to you, you know. On a silver platter, but what you said is right. I mean, one of one of Kerber and my favorite spots, dude. It takes some planning and some effort to yes. get yourself there. Right. And the average person, I could I could tell them I could drop a pin on a map and right. say, not gonna "Here's go. where you need to go." No. Dude, so few are actually going to make that effort for these fish. And if they did, just because it's a good spot doesn't mean you're successful every time by a freaking long shot. So if you don't go there and like kill it that first time, you're probably never going back. You know, because that's just <laughs> you're right. You know, it's no that's the way people fish. Yeah, yeah it, you know, it is no different when you're targeting because I love uh, targeting trophy fish, big fish, right. and and it's always uh, the, the terminology I call it. You know, the non-human hours. You know, and I always right. say when people are sleeping and dreaming about their fish, there's always somebody out there catching the dream fish that's the bottom right. line and it's no different when snakehead because snakehead fishing requires some incredible dedication and if you're not right. in tune to the in to, to the little little hints that they give you and and then you're not persistent you could forget about it right because right. Well, the, and, and when you're hooked into these fish and um it, it's like nothing else i always dream and think and go thinking all the little dirty tricks i could do to try to catch 
that 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 mother of the snakehead. And mind you, I've right. seen some really big. Uh, uh, it's it's scary. This, as thick as my leg. Sure. It is so. Sure. I I try to cross her eyes a couple of times, and I'll be freaking them. I'm going to go back because every time she gets away. Right. Yeah. Well, and and you know what? And that's. Um, it, it's it's almost like it's almost like striper fishing too, in a sense that you know I think you'll agree a lot of surf striper guys, you know they could travel to location X or Y to try and get like their forty or their fifty, but it right. means so much to these guys often to catch that fish on their home turf. So I've snakehead fished on the Potomac in in Virginia yes. and. I filmed it for a hook shots years ago and it was, we were completely unsuccessful because we had this cold front. I mean, this June cold Ooh, front came through yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. and, and that was the end of that. Right. And I have never, even though I'm, I'm ate up with these fish, I've yet to go back down there and I want to, because I know that's where you're going to get your 10 plus pounder, which is like yeah. my dream fish. But at the same time, I think, damn it. I know that fish is here somewhere. And yeah. I, I want it at home. You know what I mean? It will not be the same <laughs> taking a trip down in the Potomac. You know, because I did. did you, you want to hear a funny story? And uh, I don't know if he listens to this podcast or not, but my buddy Pete Robbins, I don't know if you know Pete Robbins. Uh, I, I heard of him, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. E- e- excellent writer. He writes for us at Food yes. and Stream. He's plugged yes. into the bass world. He lives down on the Potomac. And just this past July, he he put this post up. He says, you know, I have a, a buddy coming in who's dying to catch a snakehead. I've only ever caught them incidentally. So snakehead people, help me out. Like, you know, tides, uh-huh. like any tips you can give me because I've got to get this guy on a snakehead. So now right. here's a guy who's who bass fishes the hell out of the Potomac, right? Right, right. He, he's, 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 he's only ever caught a few snakeheads incidentally. So I, I messaged him a little info and some other people did. Two days later, they did like a 9, an 11, and a 13 in one day. Holy and I was cow. like, "Whoa, Jesus, Pete. <laughs> He's like, yeah, I don't even really know what I'm doing. We just kind of you know, took some tips and went out, and that's what we caught. You know, I'm like, oh, my God. So I know I could go down there and have a really good shot, especially now that I know more about what I'm doing than the first time I went, and I can get my 10 plus, but it will not mean as much to me as a 10 plus close to home. And, and and then some because you know and the next once you do that once you figure them out the next level is hands down I would have to say you've got to go with a fly rod. You well, know you that. Know what? Yeah, I, <laughs> I'm, I, I I'm do, doing I that. Do. I'm, I am seriously tying some nasty flies right now. Okay, because okay. in the next few days I am going to be targeting these things. Well, I can okay, I, and I can I can help you out, but to, I, I got to backtrack for a second because you cut me off when you scared me about finding my damn spots. I was talking about how, <laughs> I was talking about how I took one of one of the interns out this year down here, right? And you know, he's a guy who's never snakehead fished, and you know, my 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 number one question for new people is always, have you ever caught a largemouth on a hollow body frog? Because oh, yeah. snakeheads aside, it takes a little bit of skill and practice and patience to be successful sticking right. a fish on a hollow body. Correct. So. So, you know, it was kind of a slow day and out of the blue, like literally out of the pads just materializes this fry ball with probably, a, you know, six pounder underneath it. And I was right. like, dude, that like, that's it. Like, here's your shot. Like, right, there right, it is. Right, right. And puts the frog there. Fish I comes know up where this is going. Go ahead. <laughs> he completely, he, she comes up, she, she inhales the frog. Right. And he just starts reeling. Never swings. And I'm like, no, dude, oh, like no. you got to kill it, kill it, <laughs> like swing like you've never swung before. But, you know, it's it's those nuances that, that take time to learn. Now, so it ties right into what you're saying about fly fishing. I, I have uh, I, I have this year, I'm proud to say. I have 13 snakes on fly. Oh, I hate this you. Season. I so hate okay? you. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, though. I it, that was a, a a case of bad luck um, in a lot of instances because there's a there's a guy on our Facebook page Fred Dewey is calling Fred out now Fred is like he lives south of me Philly okay. area right and he only fly fishes for them and he's been him. very successful and he always would taunt me you know but nice. when are you gonna get your when are you gonna get your snake on the fly and. In previous seasons to this one, it was, um, you know, it was always like some monkey wrench. In a lot of cases, the spots where I was fishing, just point blank, period, had no back cast room. You know, right. you're so tight in the junk that I, I can't swing a fly rod here. Or 
I would uh, take my fly craft out one day with somebody and there'd be this perfect scenario where they're out cruising and I just wouldn't have a fly rod. So, you know, or I'd miss a fish somewhere on spinning gear one day and think I can get him on fly and go back with the fly and right. just, I, you know, I could not get a bite that day. Right. So, you know, to be successful on the fly up here, a big part of that equation is dialing in the right spot to right. do it. Oh, yeah. And right at the end of last season, I, I kind of started working this new area, and I'm just looking at the layout, and I'm like, man, I got some swing room here. I think this is going to be my fly spot next year. And starting this May, I never went without my fly rod. And oh, wow. Yeah, I love it. Between, between, between May and right now, I did 13. Now, here's the kicker. Right? Okay, go ahead. Here's the kicker. Every single one of the fish that I caught on fly – was sight fished. So yes. they were up on top of yes. the vegetation. Correct. Because while while Fred, who I give a lot of credit to, he'll spend time with sinking flies like dabbing Are you pot serious? holes sinking and stuff. Flies? Yeah. That's work. Uh, yeah. I know. So it is work and that's why I give him credit because to me, you know, uh, f- successful fly riding, it's like it's got to be a sight fish deal because it's, yes. it's very ineffective to try and blind fish and cover all the water you need to cover with just a fly rod. Correct. So to me, it's it's like they have to present themselves in in just the right way. Um, but you know, it took some time, but this was the spot. You know. So have you have you put one on the fly yet? Uh, I tried twice and she got away, and I'm not proud of it. And I tell you. Yeah. The- uh, revenge is a, a thing. It is, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm yeah. going to get her. I saw her a couple of times. She wiped at it a couple of times and, uh, my adrenaline got the best of me. Let's just put it that way. Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am sure. like a little kid. I've been fishing all my life, but I am like <laughs> a little kid. When I see that thing, my knees buckles, my heart starts beating and I, I, I can't think straight. It's that exciting. Yeah. <laughs> especially yeah. on yeah, top no. water. Especially on top water. <laughs> and, and, and it's the same. It's the same deal with with fly rod. It's like you know you, you got to whack them at exactly the right time. If you lift that rod, if it's not a strip set, you're done. And yeah. you know it's it's got to have the juice. In fact. So I do it mostly with an eight weight. I'm, I think you, I, I know you. You had told me you were going to try it with something heavier. Uh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to go eight. with twelve weight. <laughs> twelve weight? Hell All yeah! Right. Are you kidding me? Now you're just <laughs> now you're just being crazy. But I'm bump. Um, but so I'm doing it with an eight. And in fact, I, I put together like a dedicated, like the eight weight that I'm using. I only ever use for snakes because you you almost have to have a beater. Yes. Because the damn line is covered in mud. Yes. You know what I mean? Like yes. you're yes. fishing all this crap. You don't want to take the same reel that you need to take for false albacore next week. No, it's no, like, no. You can't. This is going to be my yeah. This is going to be my dedicated shit stick. Like there's so yeah. much silt and grit in the drag. It's like this is just going to be my beater rod. Because if if I don't have the opportunity, well then it's laying in the dirt while I'm throwing a frog. So right. um, I've been doing it with an eight. And I've been getting away with a straight shot of really uh, a four of forty pound as as a leader. Um, and did I? I got some flies, man. I'm just giving shout outs to the world today. Another one of the guys who posts on our page, Carl Harris. He okay, man. I I have I have you know that I've tied some snaky flies, yes. giving you some ideas for some, and they work pretty well. Well, then he this this guy Carl came along. And uh, I'll, I'll have to send you, you pictures. But if you can picture this, if you can picture two J hooks, okay, uh-huh. laid shank, laid shank to shank, okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> so now in the in the front of the frog, when you tie it on, you're actually putting the loop through both right. eyes because those those are shank to shank. Correct. So the two hooks come flat out the side oh, of the frog body. Oh, I love it! I love it! I love it! And then off off the eyes, he's got two thick pieces of mono as a weed guard. So no right. matter which way it falls in the water, it's right. There's Correct. no worrying about the hook fall. Dude, I have one that's like there ain't nothing left but like a piece of leg hair. And I mean, it has just destroyed this year. So even though I have some snake flies, like screw my snake flies. This is a better snake fly. So I, I'll, I'll have to send you pictures because. It, it it is the it is the one to have, and they're on you know really strong saltwater hooks. The guy tied it for bass, but I'm like, dude, this is like an, an awesome an awesome snake fly. Do you have so, a do you have a favor uh, a color for these fish? Well, I know for a fact yes. that yes. Um, uh, uh, down here for the bullseye, 
you, you know, you got to match the terrain that you're fishing and you got to uh-huh. really pay attention to what bait fish. Uh, but anything uh, down here with orange belly, they just go gaga. That, that, Absolutely that is, gaga. That, oh, my God. So, so I think that every every dedicated snake guy, you know, snake nut, they have their go-tos. So yes. I, I want to know what yours are. But mine are the uh, Stanley Ribbit. Yes, you know, buzzing I know that one. Toad. Mm-hmm. Okay. That one I picked up in Florida from from uh, my friend Kevin Hughes, who fishes your neck of the woods. And right. I also like the River to Sea Spit and Wah. I yes. like a popping frog, uh, yes. for uh, as opposed to just a you know a regular, you know, straight nosed frog. So when I fished in Florida with Kevin, he turned me on to those ribbits, and he was throwing brown back orange belly, and he said the same thing, and he caught more fish than I did. He's like something about that orange belly in Florida just pisses them off and interestingly i don't do a whole lot with an orange belly here for me i want everything to be straight black 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 really black, black. You, yes you, oh wow yep. and and i've i've watched uh the mayan cichlids and because they're mm-hmm. very orange and same thing with a peacock bass and they eat their fry and i have a suspicion that's why they hate it so much right that, that makes a lot of sense yeah, that and, and I've been sense, studying, but... I've been watching, and, and, and there's certain areas that I just, I, I won't fish it. I just watch. And and it's amazing what they do there. Because yeah. particularly the Mayan cichlids and the peacock, they will go after their fry, and they just get totally freaking pissed off. They want to kill Makes it. Makes a lot of sense. Because yeah. I, I saw it firsthand. I mean, that orange belly just destroyed um, you know, and up here, you know, there's a there's a part of me that that thinks in a lot of situations, right? Um, the color really doesn't matter. It's like it's a hot fish; it's ready to go. It's looking to feed. White frog, pink frog doesn't doesn't really matter. But there have been instances I've noticed where, you know, I'll uh, I'll, I'll have a fish, you know, follow black and and get nosed up, waking right behind it and right. not commit, and it'll be sitting there, and I'll put on. A white fly or I was know, a, go yellow, a yellow yes. frog or something. Yes. And sometimes they go, sometimes they don't, which tells me that, I don't know, maybe color does matter more. But con- for consistency, 99% of the time, man, fly, soft plastic, hollow body, I want straight black. And I feel really? like that's pretty common up here for the northerns. I mean, there's really? not many guys who will tell you. Yeah, I, and I don't, I don't know, I don't know why that is, but it just seems to be the the, the color that that pisses them off the most here. You know, I don't know. Um, I I, I, I would their suspect own it has, a, uh, I would suspect it has a lot to do with the the the, uh, the profile than anything, and the the, sure. uh, the silhouette because because sure. um, I like white also because when I'm sight casting, you know, on, on the dark nights, and 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 I make sure that it's uh, orange belly. But white and chartreuse, because I need to see where I'm casting, and I need to watch very closely. Because there's well, three kinds. They literally, there are three kinds of, of hits, okay? There's one that they will just torpedo to it right. and destroy it. There's, the other one, they'll snake quietly. And the third one, which is I love the most, is that loud popping noise yep, out of nowhere. You're right. Out of nowhere. You're right. Pop. I was like, Jesus yep. Christ, what the? <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. It, it is three very distinct hit styles. And the last one, that's the surprise one. And that's the one that you f*** up most often. Yes. Okay? Yes. Like, it, without a doubt. But then uh, you're right. There's the tracking hit where you, you know he's there, but he's not making a lot of fanfare. And it can be a pretty sizable fish. Right. And, like, it'll be the, the tiniest little suck. Yeah. And then when you set the hook, he goes ballistic, but there's like very little fanfare in the take. Yeah. And then there's the tracking take and kind of like the, 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 you know, the, the medium deal. But you keep saying, okay, you keep saying when you're out at night. So right. you fish for these fish in the dark. Yeah. Because yeah. I've tried that up here and I have not been particularly successful yet. So tell me about nighttime. Okay. If that's what you're doing. All right. I, I'm, I'm going to cross over with uh, have you tried night fishing for walleye? Uh, a little bit. I'm not much of a walleye guy. You're not? A little bit. Okay, well, because no. I, I do that also. I'm obviously not in Florida when I was up in, you, uh, in Canada. And, 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 right, exactly. And I, I, I've walleye fished with you in negative 22 degree <laughs> weather in the middle of Long Island in February. Yes. But anyway, go ahead. Yes, and, and do you remember what was the key thing of homing those things down? It, it's very simple. You have a light. 
but you never flash directly at these fish. You just panic quickly across. You okay. can spot I remember. Them. I remember. Yeah. You can spot snakehead the same way. So you you are essentially locating them and then casting to them. You're not out there blind chucking. No, them, no, so. I'm not blind chucking. I'm just panning across really fast. I see a silver where they are, and I shut it down, and I make a, I'll cast it at that direction. And you just hear that pop, that loud popping noise, and that's it. And the number one biggest mistake, and I'll tell you right now, and it took me a while to figure it out. I mean, it's just plain. I mean, if you ever want to hear me curse, and you could hear me about three miles out, anybody within three miles of the vicinity, they will hear me. Only because when, you know, when you're targeting a largemouth bass, okay, uh, mm-hmm. when, as soon as they crush and, and thump it, you set the hook immediately. When it comes right. to snakehead, that's a major no, 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 no. You just don't do well, that. Well, yeah, but not not with a hollow body, right? I mean, yeah. any bass guy will tell you not you don't set the hook right away with a hollow body or anything for that matter. Because these things, when they hit, they want to kill it, they want to eat it, they want to destroy it. So it's okay to count three, okay, slow three, right. one, two, three, and then you just cross her eyes, give right. it everything, and your catch ratio will increase dramatically. Because my catch ratio in the early days maybe was one out of ten. And you know how right. hard it is sure. to get that yeah. one bite. Oh. It's like chasing muskies. It is the yeah. most demoralizing thing that could ever happen to you. But you well, learn. Yeah. And there's there's great days when you're getting a lot of bites, but especially when you when you take somebody, you know, like like even like even Kerber for that matter, right. when he started doing this, I don't know how many hits you know, he got before he finally made the connection. And that's that's pretty typical. You know, anybody who expects to, you, you got to get your feet wet. And, yeah. and and you're right. I don't know how many days I've had where it's like two hours of nothing. And, you know, like a lot of fisheries, the second you're scratching your ass or like right. looking at your phone, like, that's and the it. frog's just sitting there doing nothing, it gets freaking right. pulverized. So <laughs> you, you really have to be focused the entire time if you want to be serious about this. Yeah, I, I mean, you, you're right. And, and it, it's all part of the learning process. And I tell you, man, this fish is so freaking exciting. It is no joke. I mean, if I, and he's actually, he's taken, and, 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 and mind you, I've caught some ridiculous big hogs here down in Florida. Yeah. Ridiculous. I am talking double digit. One day I had two double digits, but nothing. The adrenaline, the, 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 I get so excited when I target this freaking snakehead. It is just out well, of this world. You know, opinions certainly vary, although I think science is coming around a little bit in terms of of, of how, you know, whether these fish are as, as bad for the environments as originally thought. I mean, you know, what's the what's the Al Nee opinion? I mean, you know, do you do you see any harm? Uh, do you see no harm or people getting crazed over nothing? Uh, the, the initial part, um, you know, um, I was afraid that these fish were going to decimate all the other uh, game fish. So okay. you did believe that early on. You, yeah, you, were concerned you, you, about that. you know, we're we're all you know. Uh, I am a, 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 I I read a lot, and I'm a junkie when it, when it comes to learning about a species. But then sure. the more you apply, the more you start realizing and understanding these fish. And all quite honestly, you, you know, it, it it's a blessing in a way because um, it's it's a new fishery. Do they really um, do they really hurt the the, the ecosystem? Uh, I don't think so because if I want to target largemouth bass in the same body of water, I can, and they're there. Right. So right. Right. to to say that they did destroy uh, the overpopulation is no different than peacock bass fishing. Okay, if you want right. to target peacock bass, you can. Then you selectively go after the large, uh, big ones. But it's no different. Snakeheads sure. are wonderful. And, and, and in all honesty, uh, depending on the water that they're coming from, and, and, and I, I take this very seriously, these fish are wonderful table fare. Seriously. I was going to say, I, I was going to say, yeah, I'm sure you, I, I was, I was going to bring that up. I, I figured that you had eaten some because I don't even really love freshwater fish to eat. But, right. man, dude, I, for, for the, the, the mucky environment they live up here, 
hands down, like no one of the finest eating freshwater fish I've ever had. It is ever. It is, and mind you, I love my crappies. I love my crappies and and my walleyes. A snakehead. It's it's much much better than that. Yeah, it's firmer. It almost has much more of a saltwater fish texture. It, 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 I mean, it does. Well, the thing is a giant mussel. Right. I mean, the, the fish is a gigantic mussel, right. which is what makes them, you know, so so badass. So you, you had said something earlier that kind of, you know, I wanted to, to talk about a little bit. You, you said that you can see, you know, over the years, um, snakeheads sort of developing into – you know, a, a cherished sport fishery. Right. Do you really think that, that there's the potential for that attitude shift to happen? I mean, interestingly, I know not that long ago, like Delaware right. added them to um, their list of state record qualifiers. You can now qualify a state uh, snakehead as a state record fish in Delaware. But, I mean, do you ever think it's going to get to that point where they're just completely accepted, you know, if not loved wherever they are? I think so. I, 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 because if, if you're a legitimate uh, uh, outdoorsman who really enjoys fishing and the big hunt, there's everything about this fish that will actually entice you to say that these fish are here to stay and they're wonderful. And it's and, and you know um, they're here only because I think um, back in 2000, if I did my my research correctly, it's, it's right around then. It's been right. almost 20 years, right? Yeah, uh, almost 20 years, um, but. The excitement that I've seen people, and I've taken some very good friends out who love to fish. And, sure. and, and after a few outings out there, and obviously the first two outing is devastating to them because it's demoralizing because they thought they were really good fishermen and these fish outsmart them, <laughs> you know, and, and, and the revenge part. But I could just talk about these fish and these guys are like a whole new, they, they have so much respect for these fish. Like the largemouth bass, like all the same thing with tarpon and everything else, it is something mystical and you require some level of skill. And yeah. these fish, yeah. seriously, if you, if you don't know fishing, you're going to be a horrible snakehead hunter. Sure. You know? Sure. And so did, you, you've. Oh, it's yeah. going to change. It, it's going to be here for good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, I tend to agree with you. I just, uh, I think it's going to take a lot longer than than a couple of years. I think you know eventually, yes. But uh, I, I hope mean, right so. now they have a cold I, following. I hope so. Know? It takes longer because you know what? I am enjoying this fish. <laughs> Let everybody chase a largemouth bass. Go for it. You know, same thing. The tarpon bite is hot. The big snookers and the bull uh, bull reds. Blah blah blah. Go out there, have fun. Leave those those snakeheads for me. I want them. Yeah. I want them all. Yeah. Well, so, so you, you're you're a man that gets around, Al. You you haven't gone overseas to chase snakeheads, have you? No, I haven't. And and, and guess what? You know, uh, Malaysia uh, and even uh, Indonesia. You know, I've seen some of those beautiful. I mean, the coloration and their their their, their body massiveness. It's I want to go there and and, and, and taste chase those things now. Dude, people think that I'm nuts, but that has oddly become such a freaking bucket lister for me. I watch those videos constantly of just like the the miles of flooded rice paddy yes. and the dudes just like yes. sneaking through there and whacking those the, the, the giant snakehead, which we don't have that species here. People don't realize there's a ton of different species. We only yes. have two. Correct. The big black and white ones. Oh, 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 yes. I, dude, I am so torn up with it. We should go we should go together Dude, and uh, I film have them. I have a connection that uh, I am uh, within two years I'm going to go there, dude. Uh, but I need me, to sharpen my skills. I will, okay, yeah. <laughs> I will because I have to. Uh, you know, as much as I've been targeting these fish, I've yet to know everything there is to know. And obviously, like any fishing, you're not going to know everything. But the more I know, for sure, I want to catch the other species. Yeah. Yeah, dude, can uh, can can we fly there on the tactical anglers budget? Ah, uh, well, let's do something, okay? <laughs> let's pull every resources that we can because honestly, you know, these fish require some respect, and people yeah. really, for for God's sake, go out there at least once, give it a shot before yeah. anybody starts bashing these fish. Give it an honest shot, and then I like to Could hear their opinion. Could not agree more. 
What's Could that? not agree more. You can't trash what you haven't tried. That's not fair. Well, wait, 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 that is exactly that. That's that's uh, oxymoronic type of thing to say. He's like, oh yeah, that that fish sucks. Have you ever caught him? No, but I heard. Hello, ding yeah. dong, stop yeah. it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's get real here. You know. Well, you you and I will go we'll go to Malaysia together. Okay, we'll both wear Hawaiian shirts the entire time. <laughs> we'll flip flop. Don't All forget right. the flip flop. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and 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 even if and even if we scratch on snakeheads, imagine the food posts you'll have. Oh my god! I'm going off the rails on a crazy train. Ah, crazy Al. There's no other Al like him, kids. Let me tell you what. Hey, anyway, listen. After hearing all of that and and now knowing that uh, me and Crazy Al and a whole bunch of other people are ate up with the snakehead fish, you know, I do realize that sometimes um, you're just not going to change minds, right? You know, people are just stubborn, and that's fine. You know, you you are entitled to your opinion, and and if you want to stick to your guns on these being the worst thing that could happen to, to East Coast fisheries, that's fine. You can have that. But I think what you cannot say, okay, if you do happen to hate them, um, you know, or rather that you, what you can't deny is that they do have some pretty impressive sporting qualities. You may never go try to experience them for yourself. Fine. But I, I, I don't think anybody can come out and say, well, not only, you know, are they invasive and hurting the ecosystem, they're also, you know, worthless on the end of a line. Because uh, I I think we're kind of proven here that that's not true, and I I think there's you know something to be said for that. And you know here's the thing, right? Um, you know anybody who is is overly upset by the presence of snakeheads, okay? Um, <laughs> you should be thanking your lucky stars that the invasive that you have in your waters is snakeheads because you know guys in the south and in the midwest and in the great lakes region okay they've actually got something to really cry about they've got asian carp which everybody knows are also invasive so what's the difference between the two well an asian carp they feed at the bottom of the ecosystem on microorganisms and you know tiny organisms that bait fish and bass fry and crappie fry need to survive. So if you want to talk about an invasive that is absolutely decimating, you know, populations of fish, it's the Asian carp, okay? And the the snakehead can't even hold a single Carvel ice cream birthday candle to the destructiveness of Asian carp, and that's factual. You know, yes, a snakehead is a predator, but it's no more vicious or evil a predator than a northern pike or a chain pickerel or a largemouth bass or a smallmouth bass for that matter. You know, I, I've talked to bass pros that fish tournaments where snakeheads are, you know, they, they put some largemouth in their live well and they're spitting up snakehead fry. I've, I've seen it at least a dozen times where I find a snakehead on a fry ball somewhere. I whack that fish, pull the fish off the fry ball, and while I'm dealing with that fish, See, you know, little largemouth, or one time this entire school of crappies that was just waiting for that snakehead to not be there so they could rush in and literally decimate that school of snakehead fry in a flash. So there's checking and balancing within the ecosystem happening there. It's not all one-sided, you know. It's not like, well, the, the snakeheads always win. No, they're predators, but, you know, they get preyed upon as well. Whereas the Asian carp, uh, not quite the case, okay? And what I also find very funny and very ironic, you know, when you, when you talk about snakeheads, um, you know, everybody likes to throw around the idea of, you know, we don't want anything here that's going to mess up, uh, you know, the native, quote, fish populations. Okay, so what is the native, quote, fish population? Let's be practical and logical and, and, and factual about it, all right? Look at a lot of things in this country. A rainbow trout, guess what? That fish is native to the Pacific Northwest. So everywhere else in this entire country where they are stocked or now wild, okay, 
Um, they didn't exist there. Brown trout are not native to this country. Okay, without them coming over from Europe, we would not have a single brown trout in this country. Smallmouth bass, if I'm not mistaken, are native to the Ohio River drainage, yet they are found in bazillions more places. Guess what? They didn't exist there. Largemouth bass are native to the southern U.S. Okay, so, you know, you got that lake down the street in Ohio or Iowa or South Dakota that you love catching largemouth in. They are not supposed to be there. They were put there, you know. So, I, you know, I see guys get up in arms about the snakeheads on the Delaware because of native fish. Well, in all honesty, I mean, if you if you look at what a native fish is in here, we'd have American shad. We'd, we, we'd have some stripers, but walleye, pike, muskies, smallmouth, we wouldn't even have any of that. We'd have like chubs and suckers and darters. You know, we wouldn't even have common carp. A lot of people don't realize that common carp are not native to this country. They were brought here as a food fish and shit got out of control. And, you know, with the Delaware and, and the Potomac and, you know, and in Florida, as Al and I talked about, like with the peacock bass, they're actually much scarier things to worry about here now. You know, flatheads, for example, uh, are considered invasive in the Susquehanna River. And there are a lot of people who are concerned about the snakeheads getting into the Susquehanna. And I've also heard rumors that they may already be, okay? But I wouldn't give them a thought because the river is now rampant with flathead catfish. Now, you want to talk about a fish that will do some damage. A 30-pound flathead catfish, and I know from experience there are a lot of them in that river, that thing will hoover up a 6-pound snakehead or smallmouth or whatever gets in front of its face in a jiffy. You know, when you look at snakeheads within any given system, uh, you know, something else that I think people don't realize who don't fish for them is, you know, they have a habitat. There, There's a type of water, a type of area that they prefer to be in. So in a lot of situations, even though they might share an overall body of water with, you know, sexier game fish, um, a lot of times you don't find them in the same places. So, you know, I can, I can tell you firsthand that in three years of snakeheading on the Delaware, I've only ever caught two smallmouth bass in the places that I am specifically going to catch snakeheads. Okay, they like backwaters. They like hot water. You know, they like stagnant water. They like thick milfoil. They like duckweed. They like mud. They like shallow water. Okay, they don't want to be out in the tail out of, of a rock pile or sitting behind a mid-river eddy in the rocks the way that a smallmouth does. It's not to say you'll never catch one there, but if you do, it's probably transitioning between snakier places. So, you know, you look at that verse of flathead catfish, we have them in the Delaware River, okay? They're invasive. We have them in the Schuylkill River in Philly. They're invasive, but they will flush the entire system. You will find fish like that in places where you'll find the quote-unquote native fish, the smallmouth, the walleye, they're in the same spots, yet the uh, the up in armsness over over things like this flathead invasion we've had here, or for that matter, Potomac River blue cats are invasive. Okay, and that's ground zero for 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 snakeheads. Uh, people don't get nearly as nuts, you know. And in fact, I, don't, I they don't get nuts at all. You post a picture of a blue cat from the Potomac River, but he's like, oh, sweet catch, man. You know, flathead on the Susquehanna. People are like, oh, good job, awesome. Throw up a snakehead from either one of those locations, people flip out. Now, why is that? Well, I'm, I'm just surmising here, but what I think is that the, at the end of the day, a flathead and a blue cat is still an all-American fish, okay? Maybe they didn't exist in those places prior, but they existed in this country. So therefore, they are somehow more accepted, even though they're not actually supposed to be there, versus a snakehead all the way over from Asia and, and Malaysia, and I almost feel like it's like a twinge of, like, fish racism or something, you know? But I just, I think it's a little bit funny because, you know, if you had a lake somewhere that was chock full of, you know, tiny little largemouth or just, you know, bluegills or whatever, and it really, well, you know, wasn't any kind of stunner of a lake, and the state that you live in came along and said, you know what? We're going to do some work here on this lake. We're going to create some structure and, and do some this and that. And we're going to turn this into a pike lake or a muskie lake. We're going to stock pike here. We're going to stock muskie here. 
Well, as as long as it's state fish and wildlife saying we're going to put brown trout here for you where they've never been before, or we're going to put muskies here for you where they've never been before, most anglers are like, hell yeah. All of a sudden now, I got me a tiger muskie fishery down the street that was never there before. Nobody is concerned in those instances with native fish or the fish in the lake. You know, and that's that's not reserved for closed bodies of water like a lake. Reservoirs get stocked. Rivers get stocked with new things all over this country. You know, wild stripers did not exist in, in Tennessee. You know, the Delaware right down here with the Pennsylvania, New Jersey dump ridiculous amounts of walleye into that river every single year. Yet I highly doubt that when they came along back in the day and said, we're going to start stocking walleyes in this system where they did not exist. Nobody complained about that. Nobody was worried about the, uh, the, the well-being of the native fall fish. They wanted to catch walleyes, right? And they wanted to eat walleyes. And walleyes will eat some baby shad. They will eat some baby smallmouths, you know? It's, it's, it's really no different. It's actually, it's no different at all than, than snakeheads in reality. You know what I mean? Hard fighting fish, okay, that's going to eat some young of the year, but no more so than bass or walleye. And it eats really well and fights a lot better than a walleye, yet... I mean, I'll never forget last summer on, on uh, the, the township page of one of the towns on the river here, some, some jogger spotted two snakeheads, and they posted it, and it was like people were losing their shit. Like, has anybody informed New Jersey Fish and Wildlife? Has anybody? Like, I'm like, and I'm, la- I'm watching this thread build going, what do you think these people are going to do? Like, swoop in like the Ghostbusters to take care of this? You know? Fish and wildlife departments, they know they're here. There's nothing they can do about them. So maybe what you should do about them is go try and catch one of the damn things. Tell me I'm right. Tell me I'm wrong. Tell me you'll never listen to me again. Tell me Joe Cermelli is no friend of the native short-nosed darter. Okay? But do not tell me that when a big snakehead blows up on your frog, it's not the kind of hit that could make you poop your pants. All right? Anyway, I will catch you guys right back here in two weeks. Thanks again to Crazy Al. Snake Boy, sharpen those hooks, swing for the fences, and thanks, as always, for listening to the Hook Shots podcast. <laughs>